we don't use it so much. It's uh, um, because it takes such a long time. So, immunocytochemistry, use it frequently. And the two double stains that I mentioned, the first double stain is BDF4 over calretinib. This is, goes for the uh, uh, EPCAM complex, um, the same complex as MOC31 works. BDF4 seems to work better in non-fixed material, at least in our laboratory. If you use cell blocks, perhaps uh, MOC31 is, is better. It goes for the same, uh, for the same uh, protein complex. It's an, it's an epithelial marker. So if you have strong cells that are brown, then, then, then it's, uh, it's not the endocarcinoma, it's not the mesothelioma. And then calretinin, beautiful stain to, 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 to uh, label mesothelial cells. This is the first double stain. The second double stain, we use desmin because it works so well in non-fixed material. Um, and and uh, I don't know, but perhaps BAP1 would work better in, in, um, in the cell block and EMA as a malignancy marker. So if you have a re reactive mesothelium, we have this strong red stain and these are, 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 are the proliferating mesothelial cells. The slight brown cells in the background, that are macrophages. They're not the epithelial cell. The, the brown stain should be this dark here if there is an adenocarcinoma. And uh, here, the brown stain here indicates that desmin has not uh, disappeared yet. Desmin is one of the first markers that disappear when the tumor becomes malignant, when the mesothelial cell becomes malignant. And the malignant mesothelioma then, red here, because it's, it's mesothelial cells, it's calretinin but it's also red then here in, in, in uh, sometimes you can see the accentuation toward the cell periphery. But this strong red stain is a very good marker of, of malignancy. So this, the first thing we do when we do these two stains, we do it a lot then since we do it as soon as they are rich in, in, in mesothelial cells. The first thing is really malignant or not malignant. And when we see, if you get the signal that it's malignant, then, this situation, then we go on with additional antibodies to, to verify this, uh, that it is a mesothelioma. I, I don't have a picture here, but if it's an adenocarcinoma, then they're brown here. Brown there and red there. That is the immune. Fish analysis then. The Eurovision fish uh, is uh, uh, four-parameter four fish that are composed with three, three different centromeric probes and one probe that labels the 9p21 band. Uh, the, on chromosome 9, the band, band 21 in the short arm. And that's where you have the p16 locus. Uh, there are two ways to say that the tumor is malignant. Either you have Three cells, four cells, where out of up to 25 counted, four cells that have a gain in at least two of these, where did there, there it is, at least two of these three centromeric probes. These centromeric probes, they just count the number of chromosomes, right? That's the first criterion. Second criterion is if you have lost both signals, if you have a homozygous deletion of the 9p21 band, then it is malignant. If you have, but you have to find it in, in, in 12 cells out of 25 counted. Uh, but you do that when you, when you look around. Uh, here, this cell, that's a benign cell. Two red dots, two blue dots, two green dots, and two yellow dots, right? This is a benign cell, no problem with that. Here, it's not difficult. The, the nucleus is, is, is uh, uh, that large. It's, it seems gray in the, the dark blue color here. It's not obvious here. Um, but you can, I mean, it's not difficult to see that there are too many dots in this, in this cell. There are gains in everything. Uh, and this uneven gain. So this is an aneuploid cell. Do you find four such cells in the, in the, 
in your preparation, then there must be a malignancy there. Here we have another version. You see two red dots. I'm not certain if there is one there. Uh, there are two blue. One is behind there and one is there, two green. But there are no yellow ones. This cell is from a malignant mastelioma. It, it has lost this both signals for 9, uh, 9p21. This is a very common deletion in mesothelioma, but it's not in every mesothelioma. So when you see it, you, uh, you, you should go on looking for a mesothelioma. But it is also, uh, you see also this kind of deletion in other uh, tumors, pancreatic tumor cells, lung cancers may have it, bloody cancers may have it, and so on. But it's quite common in, in, in uh, 60, 70% of the mesothelioma cells. Okay, but then you use fish. The main t uh, reason for using fish is to tell that there are malignant cells in it. These cells that I'm a little uncertain of, are they reactive or malignant? They are malignant. Reactive cells never have those, those chromosomal derangements. Electron microscopy, and there is one thing in electron microscopy that tells you that these cells really are malignant. And that is the existence of what we call neolumina. And neolumina is a lumen made up with a wrong membrane. And the membrane that you can recognize in the mesothelioma is the apical membrane where you have all these microvilli. And the apical membrane should always be towards the surface. So if you like here, have a ves vesicle inside the cell with microvesicles in it. Only, you only see that in malignant cells. This is, or here, basolaterally in, in the cell group. If you have, these are the microvilli. You never see that in benign mesothelial tissue, in, not in reactive mesothelial tissue. Reactive mesothelial tissue can get quite a lot of, 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 of these uh, villi otherwise, but, but uh, you never see them like this. But if this should work, then it's necessary that you have early fixation. Uh, and we have in our laboratory a routine that whenever we get diffusion, we get it fresh, no ethanol added to the to diffusion. Uh, the first set, um, cell pellet that is spun down, we take a small aliquot, put it over in a two milliliter Eppendorf tube with, with the glutaraldehyde, put it in the fridge, and then a week later, if we have failed to, to reach the diagnosis with all the other messages, okay, let's do the electron microscopy. Then we retrieve the, 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 this tube and make, make electron microscopy from the cell pellet. And if we don't need it, we just throw it away. That's no big deal. The problem here, it, need, it needs time. We go to bed it, to have it embedded into plastic and cut and all this. So we it delays the diagnosis with, with at least two weeks for us. Uh, that is a little suboptimal from the clinical point of view as I see it. Okay. We see then in the routine cytology. I said that the first thing to look for is, is large amount of mesothelial cells, particularly if they are in cell groups. And these cell groups have, have Typically, they have, they have holes in them, windows like this, uh, holes like this. Here you also see a reddish background, but I will go back to that because that's something special. That's really the background that brought me into the mesothelioma business once upon a time. Uh, if you have cell groups, you have often numerous cell groups and of different sizes. I mean, these are of the Papa Nicola stains and these are or, or Gimsa stains. Uh, and the, the, the cell groups are either round like balls or spheres like this, or have more like configuration like this. Uh, both are present in, in, in mesothelioma. Like back again to this, this reddish background. That's the remains of hyaluronan that has not been washed away during staining. And that's a, that's a, a marker for, for, for the very good marker for, for mesothelioma. I'll be back to that also. In some of these cell groups, you have amorphous clots like this, acid matrix cores. This matrix, a cell matrix, produced by, by, 
by the mastoluma cell. Uh, if you see them, suspect mastoluma. Never make the diagnosis directly only on the morphology, on the routine stain the cytology. When you look at stains, I mean, it, if you see these cells, it's not difficult to say that they are malignant, right? Macronucleoli. Here, perhaps, but this is the cell in cell configuration, what earlier was called can cell cannibalism. You have, it's a little more difficult to see it in Gimsa, but uh, you have it there. And multinucleated cells are common in, in uh, mesteloma. This can give you, uh, here, yeah, here you have uh, this kind of atrix, uh, acid matrix core. Uh, it's a suspicion of mesteloma, but you cannot give a reliable diagnosis only on the basic cytology. More things that should awake your uh, mind to, towards the mesteloma diagnosis. In the pup stain, this you don't see in Gimsa, you can have these orientophilic cells, squamous like cells. Um, and uh, put it together that immunologically we know that the mesteloma cells express cytokeratin 5, which is the squamous cell cytokeratin. So this mesteloma cell is a cell on the border between epithelial and mesenchymal cells, but the and when it comes to being epithelial, they make a lot of different cytokeratins. So they can, there are something between, most of them look, look adenomatous, but there are cells that go a little further towards the, the uh, squamous differentiation. Now, if you get this sample late in an afternoon and you leave it on the bench top overnight and do the preparation, then you will see a lot of these vacuoles. They are typical for, for uh, mesteloma if they are in the entire cytoplasm, all the way from the cell membrane to the nucleus. And if they are lie over the nucleus, they punch a hole in, 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 in the nucleus like that. They are hard vesicles. And, and uh, you only see in, in, in uh, pup stain because they are washed away for some reason. In, 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 sorry, you only see them in Gimsa because they, they are uh, eluted some way. With, the, with the, all the ethanol that you have in the, in the um, pump stain. And here, you see these reddish skirts, I call it, a, 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 a haze, a reddish haze around the peripheral of the cell. Uh, that is the same thing as you have here then in the granular background. That's hyaluronan. Hyaluronan is a polysaccharide that is produced in the cell membrane of mesteloma cells. Uh, at least in large amount in mesteloma cells, it may also in many other cells. Uh, and this is the, when it's produced in the cell membrane, the molecule is so long, can be the, even the, the length of a molecule can be the same, of one single molecule, can be the same as the diameter of a nucleus. So there is no space for it inside the cell. It has to be secreted directly. And during synthesis, in the cell membrane. That's the only time when it's covalently bound to something else. When it comes out, it's a free polysaccharide and you wash it away when you, when you stain the material. So if you see this, hmm, that indicates a mesthelioma, but it doesn't define the mesthelioma. Which epitopes, if you want to go into immunocytic chemistry, it's the same epitopes as you use in immunohistochemistry. These pictures, they are from Claire Michael. She's working with cell blocks. Um, and this, she made the picture for, for, for the guidelines. Um, EMA stain here, you can see the really nice peripheral stain if you have a section and don't have the, intact, the entire cell in, in this person. For some reason also, um, same in our laboratory in, in Stockholm, if you have a section, you get this, the two, two level staining of, uh, of calretinin with a dark nucleus and, and, and the moderately stained cytoplasm. We get, this, uh, for some reason in, in our, we, we don't get really this pattern, but it's still reliable, uh, our calretinin stain, although the whole cell is, is red in that case. Cytokeratin 5, 6, she's working with a mixture of those antibodies, but it's a five, cytokeratin 5 particular that you see. I mean, this looks you definitely like an, a papillary structure or perhaps a gland, uh, but you have, you have cytokeratin 5, five there, you have the squamous kind of, of cytokeratin. 
this she's using Desmi. Um, and she has some Desmi positive cells, but most of the cells are negative and they are not macrophages, they are the, are the mesothelioma cells. So if you see a few Desmin positive cells, of course, they, the mesothelioma perhaps hasn't started to cover the entire surface yet. You have still malignant cells in your pleura. WT1, Williams tumor suppression in one. Uh, nuclear staining is a good marker for mesothelial cells but it's not specific. You can see it in ovarian carcinomas, you can see it in renal carcinomas. Uh, but uh, it is one of the markers that really indicates, yes, this is probably Mr. Luma, but you, you can't use this one alone. D240, at least, this is, I'm very fond of this D240. Uh, staining in the periphery of the cell, uh, originally staining for, for uh, uh, lymphangioendothelial cells. But malignant mastiloma starts to, to, to make it, and it tells you it's much more, more specific for mastiloma. And as you can see, Claire Michael works with MOX31 instead of BARIP4 because she has formerly fixed material now. And CEA. Now, there are many different CEA preparations. Uh, we tested several of them in, in, in the material of 100 mastiliomas, and the DOCO preparation. The Medoco monoclonal CEA is the one that will exclude malignant mastiloma. There are some cross-reactive antigens in the mastiloma cell, so there are some other, particularly if you use polyclonal CEA, that, that will, you will get the reactivity in 10-20% of the mastiliomas. But use the DOCO ones, and, and if you have stain there, then you can, uh, then it's something else, then it's lung cancer or something. Okay, that was, which was the compulsory, the, the norm, the, the, the thing you need really. And with, 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 the, with immunocytic cancer, you can make the diagnosis in 50% of the case, I mean, sensitivity 50%. If you want to increase, increase it further, if you go up to 60, 65, 70%, you need additional analysis also. At least I need it. Uh, and first, some word about biomarkers. What is really biomarker? Biomarker that tells me something. And some of these substances that tells me something, some of them are bound to cells and some are sec secreted. That's soluble markers in diffusion. If they are cell bound, we are happy to demonstrate them with immunocytic chemistry, right? And we are a little reluctant to, to start analyzing things that has to are dissolved in diffusion uh, supernet. Uh, we have to use other techniques. We don't read the result in the microscope, but in, in a, a machine that tells us how much of it is in the ELISA plate. There are today two markers that are established in clinical routine. There are a lot of studies performed to expand this, this uh, uh, battery to, I mean, to additional antibodies to improve uh, their, their utility. Uh, we use it so far only in diffusions. Uh, the long-term idea would of course be to use it in in, uh, in serum analysis, because then you can perhaps go to by checking up on risk groups uh, in a regular basis, find the tumor even earlier. When it has established an effusion, then it is often a quite advanced condition. So today, both these markers are analyzed by ELISA. Uh, when we, we started with hyaluron no, once upon a time, um, we used the high performance liquid chromatography and that was very, very specific. We had the pathognomonic value in about 50% of the cases, but we had no overdiagnosis there. Then suddenly 
we we were not able to continue because uh, we were we didn't get finances for for getting a new chromatograph and so so and and then came this uh, commercial um, ELISA kit and it works worked well the first year when we tested around it double time but but um, uh, after a while after two second year so it took, single cases popped up with false positive reactivity and it seemed as if the hyaluronan binding proteins that they had in the in the ELISA trace had some non could bind also non specifically to something else particularly in reactive conditions in in pleuritis diffusions so uh, and then we were sad, but then we, we had already started then to analyze mesothelium. And mesothelium is, is not so specific for mesothelioma as the name indicates. You have it particularly in, in ovarian cancer and, and pancreatic cancer, uh, and also some lung cancers. Uh, it's not specific for mesothelioma, but it's a very good marker for malignancy. High values of mesothelium indicate that it's malignant. So if you have high Hyaluronan content and high mesothelium content. Fine. Then we have a lot of mesothelial cells and we have, have the malignant. So together they help us. And we have, uh, just uh, to present, the hyaluron, quite simple chain is a, a glucosamine and a glucuronic acid. No modification reactions, no sulfation, nothing like that, and just an enormous long chain. And all this hydroxyl group makes that it can bind a lot of water, so it expands. That's what the orthopedic surgeons use when they, they put the, this uh, rustecom jelly, as they call it, in, into the joints and so on. Um, the mesothelium is a 72 kilodalton protein, a large protein, is chopped on a specific location, and this one, uh, macrof uh, macrophage. MFG, macrophage activating factor, um, is it called? That's released to the solution. This rest here, the, the CA terminal, is, is the receptor for CA125. And that's why you, when you stain mesothelioma cells for CA125, you have a lot of, of, of that stain on the cell surface because the CA125 is bound to, to, to uh, this is the receptor for it. But that is also chopped off and comes out into the solution. And you can me measure better. This is the one most studied, the Messimark goes for this, but there's a Japanese kit going for the NAC. Uh, and we have tested them both and uh, came out with this. The X axis here, that's the uh, outcome of the hyaluronan analysis. Uh, and this with the LISA, not with, with chromatograph, it could. Perhaps be slightly, but that's what we have to, to, to work with today. And here you have the NARC. This is the first chopped off fragment. Uh, here you have CARC when we use the other, the, the mesomark kit. And the red here, they are mesoteliomas. The black squares here, they are other cancers. And the blue rings here, they are, are uh, reactive conditions, benign mesothelial cell, pleuritis kinds of infusions. Uh, and you see, as you see, not all, 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 all uh, cases come out with typical values, but quite a lot of them. And we have <coughs> been able to construct a logistic model. So we just take the concentration we get for, from, for hyaluronan and th this concentration from the end, I put it into a formula and then we get the probability that the case is an esterioma. Related in the case to this distribution. This published and, and we use it regularly. Uh, yes. Now, electron microscopy, when everything else fails, then you can use electron microscopy. That was previously the gold standard. You can use it also to say that it is a malignant mesothelioma. It's a well-known criteria. I mean, go back 30, 40 years in time, then you really needed electron microscopy to say that it was, was mesothelioma. It wasn't accepted that it was. You can work, it works very well if you have cell pellet. And this cell pellet, you know, if I want to see the, the, the neolumina, 
I need to have a pallet, I can't have a, a dissociated cell. But the problem here, you need early fixation and you need time for the diagnosis. What you can see is cell groups with all the factors, the, the nuclei are even more irregular than you can see in, in the light microscopy because when you prepare it for electron microscopy, then the cells, the nuclei round up. Um, if you put them directly into glutaraldehyde, you get, this is what they look in more probably in, in, the, in the tissue. The most typical thing is this thin uh, microvilli that you see on the surface with no glycocolics at all. They are like jelly snakes. The microvilli that you can have in adenocarcinomas, they are stiff rods. So they are very, very diff different in, the, in their structure. The mesothelial microvilli are also longer than you see in, 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 uh, um, uh, in adenocarcinomas. And the uh, microfilaments are things we are looking for. Microfilaments that forms like a, a ring or a scarf around the nucleus. And this, the tonofilaments, the cytokeratin fin five structures that you normally see in squamous cells. You see it sometimes. What's also in the electron microscope. It's not that cell you see. Okay, we can't do this in every diagnosis. In every case. First of all, the sarcomatoid mesteliomas, they don't shed diagnostic cells at all. So of course we cannot say that it's uh, mesteloma if it's a sarcomatoid. The second problem, diffusion can be, can contain a lot of inflammatory cells and there can be so many inflammatory cells so they take all the space on the, on the slide. You don't see the malignant cells there. Then you can't do the diagnosis. We had the sensitivity in our material, absolute sensitivity of 63%. If we took the relative sensitivity, also including the suspicious ones where there were case cells in, the, but we didn't uh, dare to call it. Uh, we were somewhere around 75%. Uh, so these two conditions, we can't do it in every case. If we don't say it's a mesothelioma, that does not exclude that it is a mesothelioma. But there's another thing with this. Those cases where we recognize them as being mesotheliomas, they, that, they, that also gives a prognosis, somewhat. Uh, this is material from the Thai Stockholm area, the two hospitals, the Karolinska Solna, Karolinska Huddinge. Um, and this group, uh, this, this kaplan mai curve here, that is cases who have obtained treatment. And this is those who only got best supportive care because they were too bad conditions to start with. Uh, the blue line here, are those that where the diagnosis was made um, with cytology first. Many of them were verified later with, with histology, which uh, I think now is in, unnecessary, but that's nothing. Um, that's what they did. These cases are those that only were diagnosed by histology. See, there is a six month or even slightly more difference in the, in the survival. So it's the cases that you recognize by cytology runs a better prognosis. Of course, not because we detect them by cytology, but they are so that they, those with the better prognosis are more often detected by cytology. Uh, that works when you get any chemotherapy. So it's a little more benign version. We don't see the most malignant versions of, of, of uh, Mr. Lewis. Then you can say, okay, there you see that this is because you got an early diagnosis. Wrong. Uh, the problem in this study, because we studied time from, from first symptom to, to treatment, the time from diagnosis to treatment. And uh, the cytological diagnosis was obtained one month earlier, but the time compared to histological, and now we're talking about these cases where, where both 
cases. No, 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 that's the entire material, sorry. Um, it was obtained one month earlier by cytology, and that goes very well with Australia. They had 29 days, so they were a little more detailed in their calculations. Um, but our clinician hesitated to start treating based on, on cytology only. So they got the start of treatment one month later than those with the histological diagnosis. So principally, at the stage of development of the tumor, they got the treatment at the same time. Uh, we hope to change it, but uh, it wasn't so th those 10 years. Um, and as you can see, the blue line here is those that only had a diagnosis by cytology. And the green line here are those that had diagnosis with cytology and the more or less simultaneous histology. And they run, they run in parallel, right? So it's not the fact that you do, uh, that you take a biopsy, that you do a more invasive thing. That doesn't infl influence the, the prognosis. It's just that those where you can recognize the tumor by cytology, they are a little more benign. They respond to therapy and so nicely, but they are more benign. Then we had another question. Could it be, you see, those that we detect by cytology, they are that there are for some reason uh, in this group more um, less less mixed type cases than you have in this group. So we looked on on the entirely those who among those who had simultaneous diagnosis. Uh, that here uh, and only had epithelial epithelioid morphology. You see the difference is still there. It's not significant now because the numbers gets gets a little too low. But but uh, to me it's quite obvious. We don't detect the most malignant cases. We detect the slightly uh, kinder kind of kind of cases, less malignant cases. Uh, of course, they are malignant, but but they are less, slightly less aggressive. So it's about malignant so, mastoma. My side, we can make the diagnosis of malignant mastoma, right? But can we make the diagnosis of mastoma my side? Can we distinguish a mastoma my side from an early malignant mastoma? Oh, and first question we get. Malignant mastoma cytis, do we have that? Does it exist? The yeah. plain answer is yes, it, of course, it must exist. Just look at how is cancer, how does cancer develop? According to the paper by Hanahan and Weiberg in Cell, the classical one, there are six capabilities that the tumor cell must have acquired. And that there are six different genetical damages that has to occur. And that is a multi-step development, one after another. And it, that's why it takes time. So they are not simultaneous, this, this, these steps. So there must be conditions where you have some of these six uh, damages, but not the others. And they are then pre-malignant. That's a definition. Because they are on the way to, to malignancy, you only need three more 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 genetic damages, so two more genetic damage, and you have the full blown tumor. And this must go much faster than if you have nothing at all. And the pre-malignant condition condition that is inside. So there must be every mesothelioma must have an inside the condition. The problem is what does it look like? Do we recognize it? That's a key question. There are few cases published. Um, very few cases in relation to the number of cases published with invasive carcinomas. We see very, very few cases, if we see anyone at all, uh, in relation to those that are invasive. But that is nearly a problem that we, we don't don't know what to look for, or perhaps we don't get this, get the sample to look for it. WHO comes with a, a definition now. 
Uh, morphology that can be considered as should be considered as a mesteluma incitum. Uh, first of all, there should be no proliferation. It's a single, say, the single layer of surface mesothelial cells. And uh, 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 these cells should lack BEP1. Or they should have a loss of both the, these P16 bands, the, the CDK and 2A is the factor P16, uh, the 9P21 band. And there should be no other tumor uh, when you do thoracoscopy. And there should be no invasive diagnosis mesteloma developed for at least one year after the biopsy. Okay? If you see that, you get something that is flat, you don't have the BAP1, and then you wait for one year to see if the patient has mesteloma. Would you do that? Is it that? Now, Andrew Schurg uh, published a paper where he retrospectively, from his logical material, uh, identified 10 such cases. I mean, this, this definition made by the WHO, that is a definition of one kind of, of, of uh, malignant mysterio what does the other mysterioma incite to? Or that's the only morphology for an insight. What does the sarcomotoid mesothelioma look like inside? To? Not like that, anyhow. So, but I can cases with this kind of mesothelioma site. And seven out of these 10 developed into malignant mesothelioma within 10 years. That is quite a lot, 70%. I mean, Look for cervical cancer where we know a lot of, of the development. There is the probability in 10 years in the order of 30, 40%. It's 70%. Wait, is it ethical to wait for one year to say, oh yeah, I was right, this was only Mr. Leoma's site, or sorry, I was wrong, it was an invasive cancer. Is, and the second question, perhaps more important question, is it possible to treat? How to treat it? Luckily, I'm not a pulmonologist, so, so I'm not responsible for the last, but that is really the key, key problem when it comes to mesothelioma site. Now, what about mesothelioma site and cytology? Cases have been described. If we go to these two papers uh, by uh, Amanda Seger and our paper in Stockholm, put them together, is 424 cases with a cytological diagnosis. There is one case out of these 400 that did, didn't develop invasive condition until a couple of years later. There is all the other ones had invasive condition within a year. Meaning in, in this huge material of almost uh, of more than 400 cases, <coughs> there was only one that was the most low one side. It would be nice to detect the most low one side. And then it's, why don't we detect it more often? Because the gene damage is there. Obviously also the, 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 the morphological change is there. So they, it, it could be put, detected in that case. Another question first, most low one side, does it call an effusion? Active enough to make an effusion, then of course we don't get the effusion to, to, to find it in cytology. Now there are some indications that you may have, they may, it may cause an effusion. But uh, could it be that it is a fairly limited area of the of the pleural surface which carries this lesion? That would be good to treat them, right? But uh, the fusion get only a very, very small proportion of the fusion comes from that area of the mesothelial cells. That is, is the atypical, the malignant mesothelial, pre malignant mesothelial cells, are they too diluted to be detected? Uh, perhaps if, if you could find some good 
marker, perhaps. No, mesothelin or, or something like that um, to, to, to make a cell sorting, to enrich them, if we have suspicion of it. But that we don't have yet, and that, that is to be developed. So, cytology can probably not distinguish mesothelomycytes from early mesothelioma. <laughs> Uh, what, what diagnosis is that has to be that is best done in these multidisciplinary uh, treatment conferences with cytopathologist or histopathologist, pulmonologist, uh, uh, radiologist, and uh, to discuss what, what to do with the patient. What will happen then is that you have. Uh, so cytopathologist comes and say, okay, here I have a mesthelioma. I'm 100% sure this is a mesthelioma. And the radiologist says, oh, I don't see anything. Then that could be an early malignant mesthelioma or a mesthelioma in cyto. Really, one way to find out is to wait a year. Does the patient live after one year? Then was perhaps a mesthelioma in cyto. But that you can't do it for ethical reasons, right? And then comes, how do you treat the mesthelioma site? Would you treat it? Or should you wait until it becomes malignant? You have to, if I had the mesthelioma site condition, or, or, or a condition that is either a mesthelioma site or an early mesthelioma, I would, have, I would like to have treatment started immediately. Then, if it's possible to, to, to find where in the pleura you have this, this uh, change, this lesion, then surgery would probably be very good. But if you do, can do, can't do it, then perhaps you have to do other, other means. Perhaps the old-fashioned old photodynamic treatment could, could, could uh, come back to be popular again. But, but uh, I don't know, or chemotherapy. The take home message that I would like to survey to you is that the diagnosis of linked mesthelioma can be obtained by effusion cytology. It's sufficiently reliable to initiate treatment without waiting for the biopsy. The exception there is if, if, if you need, if, if you need to know if there is also a sarcomatoid component. If your surgery program uh, only allows you to operate entirely epithelial tumors, then you need the biopsy. But uh, in Sweden, for example, we don't operate. We give chemo to all of them. And, and uh, in Sweden, they, they start in Huddinge, they start uh, treating the, the patients directly on the cytological diagnosis. From, from early mesthelioma by cytology. But uh, the question is then, does the treatment of these two conditions differ? So cytology works. And no fiction. I'd be happy, more than happy to discuss this further with you. Thank you. Thank you very much for your enlightening presentation, uh, Professor Yarpe. We are really glad. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, shall we go on with the question, Professor? Sure, sure. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to start. Uh, Do you perform MPAP? Uh, we are, we are, we're working on optimizing the directions for it. We have not in, introduced it into our routines yet, but it will come. Mm. Uh, thank you very much. Is there any question to Dr. 
Yerte. I have a question. And who are you? <laughs> Hello, I have a question. Ah, thank you. you. Yeah, uh, yes, uh, thank you, Anders. Uh, can you detect mesothelioma by circulating tumor DNA uh, when the cytology is negative? Cytology is negative. When it's negative, then it's negative. Uh, then you have to rely on, on the other, the conventional techniques to, to make the diagnosis. If, if that was the, your question, then you have to see, you have to be aware that is, uh, that is malignant before you can say it's Mr. Leo. Was that your question? Uh, maybe you to that Does the circulating tumor DNA work for um, Negative cytology, relating to more DNA. Sorry, I didn't hear it. Um, no, we have no, we have not optimized that yet. Um, we had tried to use to look for for uh, uh, to isolate circulating DNA to define the malignant condition, but we have nothing that is specific for for uh, it was little like that, but. Um, it's quite often negative, but but um, uh, and we have no particular pattern for a mastelioma. There are there are mainly you, you, then you lo you do this kind of of, of uh, um, next generation sequencing and, and look for 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 uh, mutations in that DNA, but there could be tumors from over everywhere more or less. Yes. More? Bir soru sorabilir miyim? Tabii ki. Aa, merhaba, iyi akşamlar. Uh, good evening, uh, evening Profesör Harp Bey. Uh, thank you very much for a very interesting uh, lecture. Actually, uh, I am a thoracic surgeon and 50, approximately 15 years ago, uh, after performing a, a decortication for probably, we thought it was uh, uh, because of the non-specific infection, uh, our pathologist reported very strange thing to me, and she said to me that uh, it was not non-specific, but probably uh, it was a mesothelioma. But she uh, stated that she couldn't say that it is mes it was mesothelioma. And she said to me that if there were a, in, a, a entity like inside to mesothelioma it would have been inside the mesothelioma, but she added there was not, not non uh, entity, there was no entity like inside the mesothelioma. For this reason, your uh, lecture uh, was very, very interesting for me for these special reasons. My question is that uh, you mentioned, uh, mentioned the uh, survey uh, regarding the 424 mes uh, mesothelioma in situ lesions. And you said that only one of them uh, turned into uh, invasive mesothelioma. Uh, hmm. Did you know what happened to other uh, 423 mesothelioma cases? Oh, sorry, I wasn't clear enough there. Um, yeah. the, the, uh, the, the First, that your pathologist 15 years ago, couldn't say that Mr. Luma said, because there was, the, the entity was not accepted at that time. WHO's definition, which points out one morphology that should be called Mr. Luma in Saito, is coming now. Okay. The first person who, who really started to argue what uh, saying that there must be mesothelioma site condition that was Douglas Henderson in Adelaide and that was about 20 years ago but he was not believed in to start with um, so this is a concept that is coming now and it's a little little uh, awkward that I mean for, for theoretical persons for, for theoretical reasons Every mesothelioma must have, every malignancy must have a precancer stage. So, so, so uh, there must be, the problem is that it has not been accepted what should be called 
uh, and it's we're just in the beginning of that area. Uh, the, the, the large material, I told you, uh, at, uh, when we put the Australian and Swedish material together, we had 400 or whatever it was cases. Um, that were cases where the cytopathologists say, this is malignant. This is malignant mastrioma. But all of these, except one, were invasive. There was only one out of 400 that we picked up by cytology that were in, in, in situ. And then is the question, why don't we detect that off, more often? We should do it, but the, I, I can see two, re, two reasons for that. Either the in situ condition is not enough to cause an effusion, or second, the in situ condition is on a limited part of the, of the pleura, so most of the mesothelial cells are the benign cells, and, and, and you don't recognize the, the very few uh, premalignant mesothelial cells. Uh, but th that is just hypothetical. I just can say we don't detect it, obviously, that often. And it would be interesting to, to develop the cytological diagnosis further, perhaps by introducing cell sorting or something like that, to, to really to, to to pick out rare uh, pre-malignant cells in, in the fusion. But we, we're not there yet. Something to work with. Is there evidence that uh, we can uh, think that it can redifferentiate, the inside to mesothelioma can redifferentiate, could it be possible, into the normal mesothelial cells? Can go back. Now, if you have, when you have the cell itself, that has this gene damage cannot uh, heal that gene damage, but it can of course be killed by T cells or something like that, and and that part of the mesothelium replaced. Uh, theoretically, no, not. There, there you had this in the Schurk's paper where he historically found ten cases that fulfilled the WH criteria for mesothelomycytes, and seven of them ten are seventy percent had developed into an invasive cancer, uh, invasive mesothelioma within 10 years, meaning that 30% didn't. Mm -hmm. so, but that is, uh, if you would wait 10 years more, then perhaps you would have it. The question is, can you, can you the first question, if you, you're a surgeon, can you recognize these cells? Can you see them? I mean, can you, normally, if you look in, you would not probably not be able to see. Can you do something, do some in, 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 in vivo stain or something like that to, to recognize them? Like mm -hmm. the genealogists use uh, iodine to, to stain the pores, right? If you could do something during thoracoscopy mm -hmm. to, to, to really to delimit where do you have the lesion, mm -hmm. then that would open up quite a lot for you. But we must know much more about these cells before we can can, can, can uh, recommend that. Because these are the very early lesions. And I mean, these are the cases that you want to treat. <laughs> We're all looking for it to cure a patient with a, with a mesothelioma, right? Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Uh, can I ask you a question? Sure. Anders, thank you very much for this nice, beautiful uh, conference. Uh, I am sure that it will be very useful for our studies. Uh, I want to uh, ask a question uh, as a clinician. Uh, is there any overlap between benign asbestos pleural effusion and mesothelioma in situ at the diagnostic phase? I don't know. Uh, you have you have these asbestos pleuritis cases. Yeah. Is there anywhere where you should look for for uh, uh, for mesothelioma condition? That is in those effusions, of course. But I don't know. As I would so much like to have a way to identify these cells. We, we don't see so many asbestos uh, um, effusions in, 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 in our lab, probably because uh, 
the asbestos load in our population is, is not on the same level as it is in, in, in parts of Turkey. Maybe we can investigate Muzaffer Hocam. <laughs> yes. huh? because Maybe we can investigate I said Anders. Huh? <laughs> yeah, but w w one thing that that uh, I've been start think of since this, I mean, this this discussion of of, of, of what Mr. Leoman said to has come up the last year, more or less. It's very very fresh in the WHO, and and perhaps if you could could look if you could find a, a, a cell membrane uh, biomarker on these cells. Why not mesothelin? And then, yeah. then you some some technique. You could do many different techniques just to isolate cells with with this on the surface, and then perhaps do do fish and, and look for for the nine p twenty one deletion or something like that on these cells. That could be a way to find. I mean, it, first of all, you see if you can 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 uh, if it is a malignant case or not, but. In, in in the borderline cases, you go on with some something like that. It's not so many cases you have to do it on, but but uh, these are the cases where I think the probability that you will find something is the largest. But still, there is no agreement internationally yet about the treatment of Mr. Lumar's side. Thank you. Emine Hocam, telefon, şeyiniz, mikrofonunuz kapalı. Evet, yes. <gülüyor> More question? Is that? I think no. May I ask a question again? Sure. Is it, <gülüyor> it is a, a little bit special, but is there any false positive case in your experience? Is there any? False positive case. False positivity. False positive. No. Yeah. That is that is the the key point. Uh, you are not allowed to have a false positive diagnosis, because if you have a positive, false positive diagnosis, then the clinician cannot rely on your diagnosis, because every diagnosis you make is in on one single case, and if if the clinician cannot rely on that diagnosis, and must then they cannot start. Th therapy without the biopsy. You must be, and if you if you want to to start working from the cytology lab laboratory to start to to, to um, uh, make uh, cytology that should be able to fund uh, treatment of, be very very careful. You don't need to have fifty percent sensitivity. If you, if you can start with twenty percent sensitivity to start, it, but you have to be super super uh, safe. Yeah. Both belt and suspenders. Every, you have to be sure on your diagnosis when yeah. you deliver it. But when you are sure, then you should say yes, I'm sure of it. And when you have done that a couple of times, I mean, a couple of times, ten, twenty times, times something like that. Then you should can should should expect the clinician to believe in you, but he shouldn't. But he he will not believe in you if you haven't haven't that uh, spe that specificity. Mm -hmm. Thank you. But we it is possible to have this high um, positive predictive value in clinical routine over a long period of time. That was shown in Australia first, and we showed the same thing in Stockholm. Hmm. Yeah. Yes, more question? Sanırım bu kadar, Muzaffer abi. Evet, evet. Are... There was uh, 88, 89 uh, participants in this meeting. Wow. 89. Yes, 90. most of them are very pathologists. Yes. Okay. Yes. We are very glad to be with you tonight. Hmm? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. You always help us. 
It's a uh, Turkish people, like... <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, you know, half of our staff in, in our laboratory are from Turkey, so... Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Herkese iyi akşamlar diliyorum. Çok evet. teşekkür ediyoruz. Çok teşekkür ediyorum Muzaffer hocam size de. Thank you very much Anders. See you later. Thank you Anders. See you later. Bye bye. Good night. <gülüyor>